Hello, my friends. Welcome to Artur Ray podcast. I guess uh, we can call it a podcast. Nine months have passed since since I last talked to Paul. But welcome, Paul. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Glad to glad to be back. Glad to bring it bring the podcast back. Yeah, it's um, nine months. I mean, you you are the first one to now come back to the podcast. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, we had a great conversation last time, so I'm like, yeah, I was. I'm super excited to come back. And I think last time when we spoke, you were not doing daily updates about Ukraine, but now you kind of are. Yeah, seven seven <clears throat> days a week um, doing updates. Um, I have like a travel setup. Even when I'm like out of town, I still I still do the the updates. So yeah, it's been it's a lot of work, but I, I think it's worth it. And you know, people want to know like what's happening you know the war doesn't stop on saturdays and sundays you know as much as as much as probably all the soldiers wish it did you know yeah i'm I'm doing now five days a week and I, i'm taking off saturday and sunday and uh usually i feel like zelensky is like okay arthur is not making a video attack charge take this <laughs> element do that you know send in the 82nd brigade <clears throat> yeah yeah well definitely it feels like Sometimes, sometimes you go days where there's like no update, and then all of a mm-hmm. sudden it's like you get three days, and it's a whole new battlefield. Yeah, for example, like the first thing we can discuss is is breaking through the Surovikin line. I remember when that happened; it was a huge deal, and then also these Moscow drone attacks kind of were working. The uh, maritime drone get attacks against the Black Sea Fleet and such big news comes in one day. All of it is thumbnail material for a, for a you know military blogger. So it's like which one to choose? And then for a week, nothing happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I mean some of it certainly I, is the natural I think ebb and flow of kind of an offensive like this. You know, given that Russia spent six months basically doing nothing but building the the sort of Vikan line and building its defenses uh especially in that northern part of Zaporizhia that you're going to have surges of activity where everything is working at once and then you're going to have to have a period of consolidation right where yeah. you know we've seen in russian doctrine they love counterattacks they rely on them um to hold positions that they get pushed out of right kind of bouncing back um so it makes sense that ukraine's going to evolve its own tactics in response to that and i think that probably means longer periods of consolidation and then much more concentrated targeted offensive actions especially when, when like the news comes they have broken through the sort of Ikela, and of course you look at the map and you look at the videos coming from the ground yes they have punched through the dragon's teeth the anti-tank ditch but i was just covering the topic also that it's Russia has deployed a lot of manpower just in the forest belts and in the fighting infantry fighting positions, the foxholes. Like it, it is not that much even about the Surovikin line or the official defensive line of Russia. I mean, they have so many positions before and after that that it, it, it's it's not even a it's nothing. Yeah, I think sometimes on the maps it's easy to look at a thin line and say, "Oh, this is a fortification." But then you look mm-hmm. at the satellite imagery and you see that that thin line is, you know, two layers of interconnected trenches, Constantino wire, you know, uh, they even appear to have cleared fields of fire so that the air on the approach to the trenches, there's no cover, there's no concealment, you know, light infantry just has to be exposed as they approach. Um, and there's almost certainly mines that mm-hmm. the drones can't <clears throat> see. So even even it can look easily on the map like like oh it's just a little black line but in reality it's you know a, a hundred meters of um primary secondary positions minefields and obstacles it's a total kill box and it's like russians are not like that stupid they they know where the heights are they are positioning the p- shooting positions and the sectors from the heights exactly to the position they would attack from because it's the best position to attack from and those areas are heavily mined kill box uh the artillery is shot in they have targeted they have practiced they know exactly what they're not gonna miss so it's even now like when ukrainians penetrate through some kind of um, mine layers they have their sappers clear away they can only follow that small path with their armor and infantry russians know this they target that small channel of like 300 meters with everything they have 
and it's it's a kill box automatically and there's no antidote for it so i mean it sounds really dark of course maybe we should lighten that up with something but <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's a huge tactical challenge for sure um but you know i think ukraine is has learned a lot about how to counter these russian um defenses you know they seem to have gotten by most by most reports they are very effective at targeting russian artillery um even a lot of russian sources now seem to be saying that their counter battery fire just doesn't really deliver effects that ukrainians you know ukrainian artillery can target theirs and they can't respond in kind um i think their ability Ukrainians' ability to disrupt Russian command and control, radar systems, you know, they don't seem, they, at scale, it doesn't seem possible, but they seem very good at localizing, saying, okay, for this 24-hour period in this specific region, we are going to target munitions, we're going to target their command and control, and we're going to disable it enough so that our light infantry can advance. So it seems like they've gotten pretty good at at you know preventing Russia from doing what you described, which is rolling out a very fixed, rigid defensive plan. Yeah, the, in the south, uh, Ukrainian art- artillery is definitely like when we we compare air, it's nowhere superior on either side. It's contested, but in the south, yeah, I would say artillery superiority. If you say if you can say it like that, it's it's on the Ukrainian side. Their counter battery fire is is accurate, effective, and they can shoot further because they have the Western weapons. So it's simple as that. If if your artillery outshoots the enemy's artillery, you cannot be hit, and you will hit the enemy. So it's as easy as that. The bigger problem is the lack of ammunition, which is a very old theme in this war on both sides. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it's definitely been. Um... I mean, all the lo- there's a ton of just logistics questions that always have to be answered. And it's hard. I think people are realizing that, you know, as wars, as any war drags on, the ability to ramp up logistical production is so much harder than people appreciate at scale. You know, it's easy to make 100 more artillery shells in a month, but it's so hard to make 100,000 more artillery shells. Um you know, I think I was reading in the U.S. I, I think we're we're going to try to like triple or quintuple our production, but it's going to take twelve to eighteen months to get it online. Twelve. The, I I have a completely false information. Then I read somewhere that U- USA is able to like triple their artillery munitions production in ten years. Like I, I, it's stupid. Oh, it might time. even be longer than that. I, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's I like, think. Oh, go ahead. I mean, it's such a long... I would also think, as you said, that, okay, we have a production line. Just scale it up, you know, get more uh, raw materials, get metal, just do everything more. Like they do in Russia, three shifts, people are done not sleeping, they're working at night. But, I mean, it's it's not that easy, actually, in a democratic system. You cannot just order things like that. <clears throat> yeah, and I think even Russia, too. I, 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 There's been some reporting, and I'm inclined to believe it, that they are pulling out a number of stops trying to keep their own troops supplied um i think we've seen it with some of the individual gear definitely i would say in the last six months we've seen russian equipment um for individual soldiers at least seem to be on the upswing right for a time they didn't even appear to have actual uh like ballistic rated body armor they had those like metal aluminum shells they would wear um, yeah. But they got it somewhere. I, I, I think probably China was selling is selling it to them, um, and so I think they've had to reach far and wide and make some pretty rough deals to get other people's artillery shells. You know, in addition to their own production. Yeah, today I, I read about the news and the whole of Western media is writing about it that Kim Jong-un is very stoked and hyped that somebody actually needs him because Putin's Russia now needs everything military and China is not openly willing to contribute, but North Korea is, is and they have a stockpile of, of uh, Soviet ammunition. So Kim Jong, supposedly, I mean, this is a rumor to to come to Russia and visit Putin. And the funny part I was mentioning in a video also is like, yeah, okay, they can make these deals, but they 
have a land border, North Korea and Russia, and they built a railway there. They built a, a bridge over the river, railway bridge. It's called the Bridge of Friendship, of course it is. And from the North Korean side, it just goes to the bank of the river and there's nothing. They never finished. It's just the fresh Russian style production that like or Chinese style construction production that was never finished. Just a railway dumping into a hellhole. So I don't know how are they going to get those North Korean uh, munitions there, but it's it's going to require uh, years of building. So, <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. It's like even if you have ammunition, it's just proof that, again, lo- logistics don't happen quickly. And even just the movement of that scale of stuff, again, you know, a truckload of a few hundred rounds, easy to get to Russia. But mm-hmm. when you want to move 100,000, you know, or continuously, yeah. Right, you have to you have to have better infrastructure. Even if you had a rail lines and a rail yard, loading one truck at a time isn't going to cut it. You know, you need to find a way to get tens of truckloads of equipment onto rails and crossing crossing all of Russia. So yeah, I mean, yesterday I remember, or was it two days ago when the first Challenger tank was destroyed? Was it two? Mm-hmm. Do you remember? Uh. No, I haven't heard. I, I last, I hadn't heard this. I hadn't even heard that the challengers were uh, rolled out at this point. Well, supposedly, supposedly the first challenger tank has been destroyed. Video evidence, stuff like that, and and people are still shocked. They're still kind of like, talking about logistics and everything. That these repair shops, for example, for infantry fighting vehicles and Western Leopard tanks. I remember covering this topic for so much before the counteroffensive began that the tanks are not the thing, the repair shops are. And people are like, no, we need the tanks, we need the tanks. But the tanks will get hit, they will get damaged, they will get destroyed, and then you need the logistics to, to repair them and fix the parts. And like the same, it happened to Leopard. We all got shocked, the whole world got, and now it happened to the Challenger tank. And I don't want to know what happens when the first Abrams gets a scratch on it. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and... The U.S. military, at least at least many other Western militaries, they understand like they operate with budget constraints. They sit there and go, "Listen, we need a tank that we that can we we can affordably repair." You know, mm. they think about selling it to other vendors, so they say, "Okay, like the Challenger might get purchased by, you know, uh, you know another allied nation, uh, South Korea or something." So they say, "Okay, it's gotta it's gotta logistically work for these for other other people." U.S. defense industrial base has no such constraints, right? If you can win a contract with the U.S. military, y- you print money. And the U.S. military yeah. has basically a, 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 a blank a, check. Yeah, a blank check. So they don't, they almost, if you're designing a weapon system and your goal is to get as much money from the U.S. government as possible, you would design it to actually require lots and lots of maintenance, you know? Yeah. So and it's... is is that how I'm I'm not so familiar with the tank platform, but is that how uh, the Abrams tank is a little bit? That's the rumor. I, I again, I was never in an armor unit, and certainly I can't compare apples to oranges. You know, I I can't tell you the cost per mile or repairs, but um, what I have heard from s- some U.S. like analysts have said that uh, as fast as they can get leopards and challengers to the Ukrainians. Um, they said that basically the Abrams are logistically more complicated. They need to spend more time training mechanics. Um, some of that may also be the fact that it's easier to get leopard parts from Germany to Ukraine than it is to get uh, Abrams parts from the other side of the world. Oh, yeah, definitely. And even if you if, if you zoom out a little bit and if you look, I, I want to tie this to a, a doctrine, NATO doctrine of fighting. If you look at the tanks, the tanks are given to Ukraine, the infantry is trained on NATO standards. And now the West the analytics might say that, OK, you have the tanks, you have the training, you can fight according to NATO standards because we have given you the equipment. Then one major part about NATO standard fighting is insane superiority on the sky in the sky this is how the gulf war was done and the, the it, it's reco- that's one of the primary necessities to fight uh, successfully on nato standards so we have given them everything except for the planes so i don't even see myself how it would be possible to demand nato standard fighting if they don't have the equipment for it yeah 
that's that's an argument I I also I agree with 100%. I think NATO doctrine relies a lot on air superiority or in, even not general air superiority, you know, like like you sometimes see in like the Gulf War where like, you know, the Iraqi air force was totally wiped out. Mm-hmm. But just having localized air superiority, being able to say, "Hey, we need a 24-hour window where in this region we own the skies." And yeah. and but without the ability to do that, cuz you know, as I point out, right? Like one of the ways doctrinally that NATO forces are supposed to solve kind of the minefield problem, right? If there's a deep minefield, you can't cross it, is air mobile forces, right? You load up a bunch mm-hmm. of helicopters and you hop over the problem. But without the ability to even locally establish air superiority um, or even just having enough combat <clears throat> aircraft, now you are stuck clearing minefields. And as we see, it like NATO, you can be hobbled, the doctrine's meant to work with like one disadvantage, basically, but Ukraine is facing down an, uh, you know, an, an enemy where, with two major disadvantages, which is a lack mm-hmm. of mine clearing equipment and a lack of uh, air superiority. And so between those two, I think they've had to sit there and go, okay, there's some NATO tactics that still that work for us that are relevant, but some things we're going to have to invent our own. Yeah, and then I see I see these blaming sentences go towards Ukraine that oh they are like when Ukraine goes on their own and they see they need to improvise, adapt, overcome, they make their own um, decisions on the battlefield. And I see some people blaming that you're not supposed to do that. That NATO countries don't do that. It's your own fault that you don't fight according to the tactics, according to doctrine. But they cannot because they don't have the they're fighting on crutches. You know they don't have the air force. Uh, they don't have the mine clearing vehicles. For example, about the mine clearing vehicles. You know the Russian um, mine clearing explosive string that shoots out the string is like meteorite. It's called. Mm-hmm. Um, Ukraine has about like fifteen of them, and like some of them are destroyed now. But they got all of them from Izium, from Russians. So mm-hmm. actually, the biggest mine clearing vehicle supplier to Ukraine has been Russia by now. Uh, I don't, I don't know if NATO has given Ukraine these explosive. How do you call them even? Yeah, we we call them Miklicks. It's Miklicks. An, some English uh, acronym for like mine launch something. I'm not sure, but but even NATO doctrine, right? We there's very few of these Miklicks in mm-hmm. a typical brigade. I mean, a, a few, you know, a handful, and they can only clear a hundred meters at a time. So if the <clears throat> Russians, by some accounts, have five hundred meter deep minefields. Imagine having to bring something as vulnerable as a Miklik. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's an armored vehicle. It looks, it looks like a Bra- you know, kind of like a Bradley without a tank uh, or without a turret. Uh, but imagine having to bring that thing up five iterative times to clear through a minefield under artillery under fire. fire. Yeah, it's like, yeah. I mean, it really. I think if. NATO and the U.S. planners were smart. They'd be looking at this, and they would be taking copious notes and say, hey, our troops need to become better at clearing mines. We need to, um, you know, find a a better—engineer a better version of a Miklik that can clear deeper minefields. Something. Um, Because I don't think this is going away. Somehow I also feel that Western doctrine has evolved a little bit ahead of its enemies. They're like, okay, nobody's fighting the Second World War style anymore. Deep minefields might not even exist. We need this air superiority doctrine and stuff like that. And it is very effective if you're fighting a Western power. But if Russia is just stupidly laying mines, there's no answer to it. It's stupid and simple. Yeah, and it's sort of telling because... Ultimately, if you look at the Taliban or the Iraqi insurgents, an IED is just a mine. That's all it mm-hmm. is. It's an improvised mine. Doctrinally, it does the same thing. And the the you know the Taliban or Iraqi insurgents would lay lay their IE, lay their mines their IEDs by sets of two, three. Right? If you had four IEDs at a site, it was like a crisis. Um, and we never really solved it. Like, we made them less lethal, right? We we built MRAPs, we protected mm-hmm. soldiers. But if an MRAP hits an IED, I can tell you from experience, that MRAP is, is, is mission, like, it is mission ineffective. You've got to tow it up. 
You got to get your people cross leveled. It's it's so we never really beat them. We never defeated those mines. Um, and so when you have something like this now, where Russia is is deploying not you know two thousand mines in 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 a you know in an area, you're talking two million by some reports. Without a way to clear them at scale, it, it's really really very effective still you know yeah and i am also guilty of this without even like knowing this information before but most of the people were expecting before the counteroffensive began for ukraine to do what they did in Izium, to do what they did in um uh, the south right before the Kherson, and <laughs> People were expecting, okay, you, you, and Ukrainians were actually doing it. They were using these leopards exactly the same way they used on Kharkiv offensive, right very close to Russian lines, hop off, uh, small mobile groups of three and four men, hop into the trenches the Russian would run, run away. But the Russians didn't run this time. They ran in, in Kherson, they ran in Kharkiv, they didn't run this time. First leopards were lost, and then it was a shock for the whole world. And, and Ukrainians had to change their tactics. Because this didn't work anymore. <clears throat> and it's not NATO standard tactic to do that in Kharkiv, but it worked. But it doesn't anymore. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And, you know, again, I think that... I think to what you said about the the NATO has spent a long time writing its doctrine to fight other NATO-style countries. And while, yes, there's a rule that says that, hey, we try not to deploy landmines that last a long time... I think I think NATO planners like internalize that belief that like no country would deploy mines at this scale. And the fact is Russia's shown repeatedly it doesn't really consider itself bound by a lot of these treaties. So the fact that regardless of how you feel about mines and in the long term I think you know we know that it's it's going to be very hard for Ukraine to just have portions of their country that are mined. Um, they're a battlefield reality. It's like you wish it wasn't. You wish everyone played by the rules. But in in war, you know, rules become optional very quickly. And Russia's shown mm-hmm. that if it's, it's willingness to do so, if it gives them a tactical benefit, like they absolutely will do it. I remember um, personally getting triggered. Like I, I try not to show it on YouTube. You know, as a military blogger, you try to at least show that you are semi-neutral. But seeing before Ukraine got the cluster munitions from USA, and there was a huge debate like two, three months before it, but let's say one year before. Uh, you have seen this huge photo of Ukrainians gathering all of the Russian cluster munitions together in Kharkiv. It's like a huge pile of thousands, maybe tens of thousands of Russian cluster munitions, which they have been using on schools and kindergartens from day one. And then we have American activists or European German activists saying that these cluster munitions are bad, don't use them. And I think, okay, whose agenda are they fighting for? Because Russians are using it. They don't want Ukrainians to have them. In my eyes, if I was Russia, I would fund these groups, these activists, to say this. Like, I would give them money because they're like, working for me. So I got so triggered, and it was really hard to, like, keep it down. <clears throat> yeah, I, I also got, you know, aggravated by the U.S. Because the fundamental debate... Right. If you look beyond the fact, you know, that like cluster munitions are bad, well, they're bad because the idea is that they have a certain percentage of duds, which means there's live explosives in in a field or or wherever they've been deployed. And if this was a conflict with with no mines or limited artillery, I'd say, yes, that's a real danger. But you're deploying these cluster munitions in areas where there have already been an eye watering amount of artillery shell shelling. So there's almost certainly it, it, dozens, if not hundreds, of unexploded rounds in any given square acre where the fighting's been heavy. And the Russians have been mining the place like it's going out of style. So a- any given field in basically anywhere in southern and eastern Ukraine where there was any level of fighting, you're gonna, it's going to have to get swept for explosives, period. And yeah. so that cost is already baked in. So the fact that now the question is then just do you want to do you want to confer if you're going to have this happen you might as well let Ukraine get some advantage out of it because you know mm-hmm. Ukraine has used has followed 
NATO rules on mines. They've they've had time time uh, fixed mines like they used outside of uh, Volodar, where they only last for I think seventy two hours, um, and that's been like kind of a tactical hamstring. So I think it's I think the actual harm by providing cluster munitions is as as close to zero as you can get in a conflict. Um, yeah, because the fields, as you said, they're already oversaturated with explosives. Russians, Ukrainians, whoever they are from, if civilians come back and live there in the future, they cannot do so without paying the cost and f- like going through and exploding everything on the field. The cost is there already. Plus, the thing is, people were saying, OK, Western countries need to ramp up their artillery shell production. But Ukraine was using many times more artillery shells to clear a trench because artillery sh- trenches are kind of designed against artillery shells. So if you don't have cluster munitions, you're going to use five times more shells to clear the same trench. So it actually saves up on Western munitions. <clears throat> yeah, it's true. You were going to get that same number of unexploded ordnance in those fields no matter what. It was just a question, like you said, of, of efficacy, right? Why why use 100 rounds of artillery when you can use two cluster munitions and they'll be more effective than that artillery was. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And I, I wonder like if other militaries are looking at this conflict and what lessons hopefully they're taking away from this. Cause especially when I hear general officers at the Pentagon, uh, like offer some like strong critiques of Ukraine. Sometimes I'm like, I don't think they have, I'm a civilian with no insider information and it's so obvious what they're why they're doing what they're doing. There there's so much innovation. Um yeah, I wonder what lessons you think NATO's going to going to learn from this. I already know well, Estonia is part of NATO my country, right? I was a conscript and when I was in the army Estonia did not have weaponized drone units, weaponized drones at all in the military system. Now they don't want to talk about it. If somebody asks, they say no. But I know from some inf- inside information that Estonia has poured as much as we can pour money to acquire uh, weaponized drones, kamikaze drones, into our official mini- military list of, of weapons. Or We're learning to use them. We're training conscripts to use them. So Estonians are adapting fast. We don't have like much money, but we're learning what we can. So I, I do hope, like USA, I know, they're like focused on military. They will adapt and overcome. But Germany... I want to see Germans change and learn and, and adapt to this situation. Uh, yesterday or the day before that, I covered a story where Olaf Scholz supposedly personally halted the sending of Taurus missiles to Ukraine. So he still sees that he can appease Russia or, or talk to Russia. I want to see Germany learn from this conflict, but it's not going to happen yet, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's It's hard, I think, with high-level leadership, sometimes they people beyond a certain level they get so fixated on a certain way of thinking like you said the belief that oh we can dialogue with russia russia isn't totally committed to this it's like they are they have and and ultimately they're not going to stop until they until they get a military defeat on the battlefield um that's the only way that they're going to reconsider is when they have no other choice and i think general officers high level politicians they th- they think, they decide, they have a certain way of thinking about things, and they really don't want to deviate from it unless, unless they have no other choice. And so I, I, I like, I worry. You know, I look at these Ukrainian drones where they've, you know, affixed grenades or mortar rounds to basically commercial off the shelf drones, and I'm like, the U.S. military doesn't even have a standard reconnaissance drone f- out into its units, and it's like. I don't think even they fully understand how drone heavy this conflict is. Uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, I would, I would call Russia um, almost a third world country. Not really, but on Russia and Ukraine in the world are leading drone warfare countries in the military terms. They're both. I mean, United States is supposed to be, but I, I'm, I'm claiming they're not because I think when this war is over, Ukrainian drone operators will teach everybody, every NATO country. And they will be like where people will learn because they kind of, it's invented on those battlefields. I mean, yeah, they exi- drone exists 
uh, every time uh, Al Qaeda or Taliban leaders have been executed or shot with missiles, they come from Reaper drones or whichever United Stones drones they're using. But we're talking about drones that cost 1,000 United States dollars. And this is warfare and very effective and cheap. And I think this kind of warfare they can teach. And, and we as NATO countries, Estonia also, we need to learn. Yeah, I... And I, I think it really, the U.S., you know, we, we, you're right. Like, we have, you know, 20 years of using Reaper and Shadow drones and, and Global Hawks. We have, we have some other drones, but all of them operate at, as aircraft, as, yeah. like, substitutes for fighter aircraft because that's how leadership thinks, right? They wouldn't understand what a quadcopter can do, but they can understand, say, hey, here's a cheaper version of your your f-18 right it can do three of the functions that an f-18 can do and so the u.s military will sit there and go oh okay we'll acquire these drones but i can tell you i'm gonna say when nine times out of ten when i asked for a drone in afghanistan couldn't get it because we would have at any given time in the whole eastern part of the country Mm. we would have maybe three in the air right I've seen Ukrainian squads running three drones, right? An observation <laughs> yeah. drone, the actual combat drone, you know, and then there's always like a third drone that's uh, uh, observing from a second angle. And oh, yeah, I see, I see at least like a Hollywood set. There's different angles of the same explosion. I'm like, are you going to get a camera drone just to get this slow-mo footage <laughs> up there? Like, you have so much up there. Right. It's wild, and it's it's... Again, just to see the U.S. military fixate so much on these like small, ultra expensive drones, and ignore the fact that their battlefield appeal is is that you know isn't that they fly at ten thousand feet and see miles. It's that they let a, a squad leader pull something out of his backpack and look out a hundred meters up, uh, you know, or three hundred meters up. And just a mile out, that's the game changer, you know? Let's a tank commander say, where are all my tanks? Oh, I can see them all right in front of me like a video game, you know, from the bird's eye view. It, it's, it's a game changer. Yeah, and, and when the war started, what was the shocking was the DJI Mavics used with grenades. And then half a year later, we started seeing first of those FPV, first-person view drones, those very small ones, very fast and agile drones that you have the goggles, you ram into small, small explosives, but they can still blow off a leg or something. So a soldier has to be carried by three other soldiers. And that is $500 a piece, mass producible, extremely fast, unable to see from the radar, unable to shoot down because it's so small and fast. It's... It's like a mosquito. It is the weaponized mosquito Russians were talking about, right? And, yeah. And, and that is, it's so new. I don't, the like, United States must have a massive secret first person view mini drone, what, funding something? They, I, I mean, one of the things in that the US government, I think, is very, it's very good at experimenting with different things and it's very bad at implementing them. Because ultimately, oh. the there's a huge gap between a cool technology. Gar- I guarantee it. Someone in the U.S. military was shown uh, an F like a drone, like what we're seeing in Ukraine, right? The FPS Kamikaze drones. Um, and I'm sure people said, "Wow, this is cool." But then, when it came time to actually say, "All right, let's get some funding to buy these," hey, we need. 10 million dollars to field you know uh, 10,000 of them and put them in the hands of soldiers or marines or airmen that's when everybody goes well you know we don't have the funding you know so i think necessity is the mother of invention i think ukraine didn't have a choice right they're like hey we mm-hmm. have to find a way to reach reach back and and hit russians where a, a, everywhere we can and they're like, this is a solution, and it's cheap, and it's effective. And, you know, I think the Ukrainian arms industry is also just good at saying yes. You know, they just go, this is a good idea. It's cheap. It's scalable. Yes, build them and roll them out. The U.S. The also, US military just doesn't do that as well. Also, look, like U.S. military, as a classical NATO standard military, they have uh, very expensive drones, fighter jets, all out of this world's future tech, and they're designed to take out these high-value targets that they can hit with 100%. But with the Russian army, 
it, it's not about the high value targets. It's about 300,000 soldiers in trenches. And then you need these $500 a piece drones that can blow off a knee, you know. It's, it sounds bad, but I mean, you cannot use a Reaper drone to take out 300,000 men, but you can use these first person view drones who uh, make chaos on the trench lines. They never know when they're coming. But one Reaper, you can shoot it down with an S300 perhaps or S400. I mean, if it's stealth, yeah, but you, you know the point, right? It's more designed to use very expensive weaponry to take out very, very expensive weaponry. But if you have massively something cheap, a life in Russia, you know, it's the cheapest mm-hmm. thing. Are you going to use Reaper on that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's also just like the cycle of warfare where, you know, for many years, high specialization was the, the, the thing, right? High tech forces, elite special forces in very small numbers kind of dominated the battlefield. And mm-hmm. I think there was this move to sit there and say, Hey, Putting all your eggs in one basket, the way that, you know, you sit there and go, hey, we have one command and control vehicle that's that's the glue that holds our entire operation together in this sector. And I think Russia came to the realization that's like, we need to find a way to operate where there is no single thing that holds that holds our military together. You could take out our communications. You could take out our logistics. You could take out... And, like, they're willing to... They're willing to sit there and go... All right, well, our soldiers are just going to go without water. They're going to go without food. They're going to go without, you know, resupply. But to their credit, their willingness to do that has meant that, like you said, there is no there is no elite target, right? There is no high-level, high, you know, air defense site that a special forces team can take out and go, great, we got their defense battery. The skies are clear. No, it's it's... A thousand dudes with man pads and so i think the pendulum of warfare is swinging back to um like many lower skilled forces like no one no one part of the battlefield is essential right the way that Mm -hmm. yeah the, the again the way that like a special forces team and one fighter jet like it was all in like they could really make a make a huge difference now i just don't think that's i don't think that's the future of war yeah it's i feel the it's more about statistics now yes i mean i, I hate to quote stalin but the death of one man is strategy the death, death of a thousand you know statistics this is how putin thinks and also i i say a lot of his shots from the head but you it doesn't really I say it for Russia, but it doesn't really apply because if you take the head away, if you take Putin away, another one will replace him. The system is there without him. Mm. Russian mindset, Russian imperial mindset of conquering wars and feeling proud about it, that is embedded in this generation who has grown up in, with Putin of 20 years, you know, or the Soviet Union uh, pensioners who feel nostalgic to this imperialistic mindset. Don't matter if you take Putin away. The mindset is there. They will... They love war, which gives them territory and something to feel proud about, you know. It is it is the partition of Russia that I see as a solution only. Like, the German way of, occup- after World War II, you know, denazification of Germany, they have the mindset that needs also, like, the antidote to it. <clears throat> yeah, I think a lot of people underestimate or fail to appreciate how... how like ethnically and linguistically diverse Russia is and that like a lot of those countries they're ruled they they've they have for a lot of their history had these very authoritarian rulers in a way that it it almost feels like a requirement you know Mm because again it's like you had in 1919 right you had the old way the czar system swept away and people thought oh russia's it's a different russia it's a new russia they're going to behave really differently there's no one from the old guard in charge and after a couple of years they started to operate exactly like imperial russia expanding their borders taking more territory extorting control and you're like how nothing about your internal politics is the same but you're behaving the same way and you know i'm i'm not a believer in like i don't think it's like the russian character i think you're a big landlocked country and you have a lot of territory and not a lot of resources so 
I think that drives it in part. Um, I don't know what the solution would be, but it's clear that it's something that is deep inside Russia culturally. Yeah, uh, the thing also, what it's the Russian mindset, the Russian person, their way of respect is. If, if, a, if a truly good democratic leader would come and, and raise the power in Russia, he would lose the power. They don't respect that. They respect when they are fought back, their boundaries are being set in front of them with force. They, the mm -hmm. people need, like, they, they feel the suffering and they then feel they're worth something. They have given something to the motherland. So some democratic leader comes, or like a softer leader comes there and really makes their lives better. Um, I don't I don't see it working there. Honestly, the mindset is just so different. Yeah, yeah. I think there's definitely and and you know, we tried it in Iraq and Afghanistan, right? We tried to come into a country yeah. by force <clears throat> and say we're going to turn you into a democracy, but what I think we was never appreciated fully is that there even in most democratic countries, there was, you know, 150 years of movements that shifted the culture so that things like free elections ideas about individuals right to have a say in their government like there's all this cultural underpinnings that happened that took generations and to sit there and go oh well it's it's not necessary anyone could be a democracy like that's not necessarily true you can't snap your fingers and and turn a country with an authoritarian mindset like you said a might makes right mindset and flip a switch over to democracy right and that's not to say like it can't be done but it's got to be acknowledged as as a multi-generational project that you know it has to happen on its own terms you know like it did and let, let's I don't want to say that democracy started in France or the French Revolution I mean democracy had some uh, some kind of sources in the old Greek system of ruling but they had slaves and stuff like that but let's say the French Revolution which is the basis of modern de democracy in Europe I mean that started with blood and violence and killing the king and then they had their revolution and then Napoleon came a new emperor right and then they had the king again and then there were war of 1812 and the there was a war in the end of the 1800s, then there was the First World War, and after that, the monarchies fell fully. And then there was the Second World War. I mean, 300, 400 plus years of continuous conflict, and we're here. And now we're like, okay, let's make everybody democratic. Let's skip those 400 years of killing everybody, and then we can, you know, do it with one generation. It's too much to hope. Yeah, yeah. And again, it's like... Sometimes an old system has to like fail tremendously. And I think if there's, you know, there wasn't much good to come out of the first world war, but if there was, it was that everyone from the highest high to the lowest low saw that like, Hey, this system of like, of, of monarchies mm -hmm. and Kings, like it's, 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 this is, it cannot sustain itself. It can't be functional in this world. And you know, if I have, like, I, my hope would be that perhaps parts of Russia look at this war where it was, it, it's so pointless, they've had so many casualties, it was for for nothing, right? They, they it, The average Russian has had their life become so measurably worse that you hope maybe they sit there and go, huh. This system may have may just have fundamental flaws that we can't reconcile. I yeah, I had these hopes, and when when war started, I remember I looked back at my videos and I, I think, wow, what a naive guy. I remember reporting that oh, so much bad things that Russians have lost fifty thousand men. I mean, they're surely going to see half a a quarter of a million casualties later. There's not we're not even close to that, and Putin has really taken care. He has built a propaganda machine that makes people apolitical, unable to think, running away from responsibility. And this is all in the subconscious. It's automatic. A, a responsible choice is here. 
the person's mind is feeling is like, poof, uh, I don't want to get into it. You know, I've spoken to Russians. They're like, I don't really want to get into politics. It's such a subtle thing. I don't want to get it. But with that small sentence, he's basically turning no, like turning a blind eye to all of the killing in Ukraine, all yeah. of the responsibility he could take for his country. So it's, it's such, I, I hate to say it, but their propaganda, as bad as there are me, is, the propaganda is, is perfect. It works. Yeah, yeah. But it, you know what? It didn't work on Prigozhin for it, you know? I, I, it, like, uh, yeah. I, I mean, obviously, Prigozhin was like a war criminal of the First Order. Um, mm-hmm. But he, if he did anything good, he did expose or attempt to expose just like the vulnerability of Putin and the larger system. You know, the question is, did the Russian people internalize it? How do they actually feel about Wagner Group? It's tough to say, you know, but I think I don't, I don't know if Prigozhin had any kind of like noble intentions of let's let's make Russia better. I think he wanted Putin's place. Yeah. <laughs> oh, like... for sure. But I think <laughs> accidentally he may have exposed the the system as being uh, not nearly as strong and authoritative, you know, because ultimately I think every Russian believes that if they state their true internal thoughts about the world, that uh the russian state will punish them severely for it and uh, that's probably correct right uh, you know if they do it on a large enough platform but at least pretty goes and sat there and proved like you know i could i could march on moscow <laughs> and threaten to burn it down and if he hadn't blinked like he may have pulled it off and uh, if nothing else it hopefully sent maybe just a little a little nugget in the back of a lot of Russians' minds that say, this is the state that I've been afraid of for so long? They couldn't stop this guy from literally marching through the capital with guns. What are they going to... Yeah. They can't stop all of us, you know? Are they really the strong, the all-encompassing strong state that they want us to think they are? I also have I have this hope, and I'm I'm still hoping that the Russian people wake. They wake. They're like asleep right now. There's 150 million sleeping Russians in the country, or less or more, and they're gonna see something and wake up. But I, but well, hope dies last, you know. Yeah, yeah. Again, I mean, it's like, you know, there's no there's no draft in Russia because Russia, I think, knows that drawing up a bunch of military age civilian men would be a political disaster so like someone someone inside the kremlin believes that they're still that the people in russia still have some power and that their dissatisfaction is at least a risk you know yeah, I mean, Russia is lacking manpower to man all of the sort of eco line and the secondary trench line. They're lacking. They need more manpower. But the choice has been to do hidden mobilization, to just snap people from universities or do government says to the companies that you need to give us 10% of your workers, stuff like that. But not officially, because last fall, one million men left Russia after the announcing of the mobilization. So, I mean, Putin, Putin doesn't he, he's afraid of his people, really. But it's moving to that direction, because if, if things continue as they do, I don't think Russia can replenish the losses with hidden mobilization anymore, manpower losses. Like I, I announced that, I think, in, in January or February, there's going to be a mobilization. That's my prediction. Yeah, I mean, you read, you know, I was reading that they, the Russians are offering, like, Kazakh citizens, like, it was like, Two to five thousand USD a month to fight. I'm like, that's not a sustainable plan. Like, you cannot. You, Russia cannot pay those salaries to anybody. Um, and but it seems to need. To, they busted actually recently. The Cuban government said they uncovered a human right. trafficking ring where I they were getting young Cuban men to Ukraine and then forcing them to to fight. And, of course, it makes sense because, you know, Cuba has universal military service. So if you, a, a young Cuban man already has all the military training they need. Um, but it's telling that Russia is willing to run a scheme like that under the nose of the Cuban government itself. Uh, one of the 
you know, an allied country uh, and take that risk just to get more manpower. I think it's, a, I, mean, I mean, it may be a sign of desperation. It is, it is. And you can imagine also, it, it gives us an idea of how Russia is run, like uh, intelligence service slash mafia organization, mafia syndicate, because the generals, right, they get orders from the Putin or the, from the Central Committee or intelligence committee whatever it is they get orders that we need to man these trenches we need more men so the generals are like okay what do we do and one guy's like i know a guy and that guy is of course the leader of some kind of human trafficking syndicate and they officially in the russian army command structure accept human trafficking as a way of getting troops like that's an official acceptance of so the russian army does things so if if somebody would say that a year before the invasion that you wouldn't even think that's a possibility but it's it's an official country we're talking about that behaves like that yeah i mean truly like russia russia has has shown and again i hope other countries look at this when they think about their own war plans like russia has shown that at a certain level of seriousness that like the rules and decor and like good governance they just don't apply they don't a country doesn't you shouldn't expect your enemy to follow the rules right Mm -hmm. human trafficking yeah like of course like coercing people coercing civilians to fight bringing people in as laborers and turning them into military uh uh, fighters like those are fundamental war crimes but when when you have an actor like russia opposing you they just they they believe that the rules are just a farce. They're for show. They're for other countries. You know, they're for fights. They're for wars like the U.S. versus the Taliban, where the U.S. just you know it can follow the rules because it's not an existential fight. But I hope. Yeah, and and if if, if you have such an actor in Russia, if Russia. I mean, they don't, I don't believe in it with any cell of my body. Ukraine is going to win. But the thing is, that's why Ukraine also needs to win for the world, for everybody, not only for Ukraine, because this is not a fight between Russia and Ukraine. It's a fight between the Western rules of engagement and Russian way of governing the whole world. If if this conflict ends any way, then favorable for NATO, it's a Russian win. Because the, Russia... like. The only way outcome is that Russia fully loses. Otherwise, it's a Russian win. Even if this conflict ends and Russia pulls out and retains as a country, they just fought kind of the entire NATO and they retained their country's, you know, existence. So, you know. Yeah, it's it's troubling when you see things, you know, like the coup in um, Niger, right? Where mm-hmm. the military seized power and the people that supported the coup went out into the streets waving Russian flags. They were like, oh, democracy is is code for Western puppets. The West is weak. Democracy doesn't work. We want a military. We want a strong authoritarian country. We want to do things the Russian way. And, you know, that is a way, as you talked about, that is authoritarian. It diminishes human beings freedom to live their lives um it's it's regressive in so many ways and it's worrying when you see like military juntas take power and then you saw when it happened in niger then you had the military in gabon do the same thing they said you know what you're right democracy is a farce the west is weak we need to become strong like russia and it's it's Again, what you don't want is a global order that is divided along those lines between these authoritarian countries that govern like Russia, that govern like China, and Western countries that emphasize you know, individual human rights, the right of people to do things and go places and hold different beliefs. You know, it's a it, – again, I don't – I don't want to like reframe – the Ukraine conflict as an as an existential threat, but like you can't argue with the data, right? These coups didn't happen until Russia became like juxtaposed itself against NATO. Yeah, and uh, a lot of people would explain these coups away that this is Russian propaganda working in those countries, but 
as much as I hate to acknowledge it, uh, these people have suffered, of course, under the governance of a democratically elected leader, and they chose to do this. A lot of the, not all of the people, but a lot of the weaponized people in that country chose to support that junta, that Niger general committee who took the power. And if these people are brave enough to take the power and they feel the support of an authoritarian country with a huge military, then it's better spreads. It's like a domino effect. It's like when the United States tried to like stop the spread of communism in, in Asia. or it's a, It is a new Cold War. It's, mm-hmm. it's a... It author, 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 authoritarian plague, you know? It's just spreading. And when... Russia shows that they can do this stuff. This encourages other countries. As you said, this wouldn't have happened. So I'm I'm not sure we have seen the end of these coups. I think some African countries might follow suit. There are some countries in that area still that are struggling and, and they're on the verge and they're very acceptable for Russian propaganda and influencing, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I I think you're absolutely right. I think... The encroach of authoritarianism is is one of the biggest threats of the coming decade, for sure. And I think the message that so many countries get is that they look and they say, oh, democracy makes you weak. Democracy makes you ineffective. Mm. Uh, you know, human rights prevent your country from achieving what it wants or prevents you from achieving growth. And when you when you see a country like russia or like china appearing to do well appearing to succeed it definitely changes the mindset of countries again the countries like you said that are on the margin you know mm-hmm. that have like new mm-hmm. democracies and are kind of like unsure of it you know like maybe this system yeah. works that those are the ones that you worry about you know again if countries that have been democracies for a hundred plus years are less likely to fall into that sort of trap. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and Russia has unfortunately quite a lot to gain from those countries. They have they have diamond mines, they have gold, they some of these countries have oil, they have I don't know, not even lithium, I guess. Mm. They have very important minerals in that country which Russia is just importing and exporting and making billions out of that. So I, I hate to acknowledge it, but Russian economy is getting a lot because uh, of uh, colonialism, like pure colonialism. They're just extracting resources from those countries, and it unfortunately works for their economy. Yeah, so, yeah. So I did want to at least talk a little bit about you know something we had mentioned prior to this. I I. I've been talking about on my channel that after like a year of work, I I finally launched my uh, my gum, my it's called Strike Gum. It is a can you show? yeah yeah yeah. Let me try to put it up there real quick. <laughs> it's it's called Strike Gum. It is a pre workout gum. We uh, I worked with a manufacturer here in the U.S. Uh, to get basically an entire scoop of pre workout in like a single piece of gum. So we have ninety Ooh, milligrams wow. of caffeine in there. Um, yeah, yeah, that's like that's like an entire Red Bull. Um, when one piece I think of gum, it, yeah, yeah, hell yeah, man. <laughs> if, yeah, if it's, you do that, you go to the gym, you're gonna mm, pump, you know, crazy. Yeah, yeah, no, I like, I literally cannot take it after like 4 p.m. or else I will, I will not be able to get to sleep. Like it's, it, 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 it hits different for sure. Um, but so the, the goal, yeah. Huh? The, the I mean, goal is if, when you go to the gym, you, you just like chew it before and yeah, like if you chew it ten, I'd say yeah, about ten minutes before. By the time you get to the gym, like you're gonna be, you're gonna be ready to go. Like more I, for me, like I'm a coffee guy. I drink a lot of coffee, um, but because this isn't ingested, right? Like you don't swallow it and then get the caffeine through your stomach. It's the caffeine gets absorbed through your. Um, tongue and cheek sort of like uh like dip you know how the nicotine goes right into your bloodstream through your mouth and so you don't lose any caffeine in that first round of metabolism like your stomach doesn't break any of it down and that's why it like it even if you're a caffeine guy or you're someone who does energy drinks like this will still get you 
get you hyped up. But how did you like the Strikecom link? Of course, in the description below. Go and go and check it out. And I can I can I order? Yeah, order yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we do ship it. Yeah, we have shipping to Europe. We have shipping to Estonia also. Yeah, yeah, maybe. yeah. To the European EU. Union. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, uh, I'm very sensitive to caffeine, so I'm gonna I'm pump myself crazy on that. I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like one piece, take it like around noon, you know. Um, but more more important than that, you know, I am actually donating fifty percent, actually over fifty percent of the profits from this first production run uh, to charities that um, support Ukrainian like humanitarian assistance. Um, we've got a couple picked out. I think Hope is one, and then UNHCR. Um, just. I mean, because again, obviously, I, I, my, you know, even though I try to be a neutral analyst, right? Like, obviously, my heart goes out to all the hu the suffering in Ukraine, mm -hmm. and I think this is a great way to do something because it's like if I can grow this to to a real like big company, and I'm telling you, I think if you try it, you'll be like, oh, this is something special. Then like it could really make a difference for Ukraine because even after the war ends, there's still going to be such a tremendous amount of like humanitarian cost and the rebuilding is going to be so expensive. So anything, you know, we can do, I can do to help. I think this is the best vehicle for it. Can you, can I ask like about, are you open to talk about the process of how did you get there? Yeah. How did you, you said it's a, almost a year in the making. Can you talk to yeah. me about how you so do it? Yeah, so I <clears throat> was... So sort of the origin story is that, you know, when I was deployed, right, we would do these, like, long combat patrols, you know, 12 hours a day, and, like, we still had to work out. We were there for a year, and the only thing we had were these, like, off-brand energy drinks called Rippets, and they were so gross, and, like, imagine, like, pounding just energy drink after energy drink. I would sometimes take them on patrols. Like, I would have, like, cans of energy drinks in my cargo pockets. And, it, and they would get, like, warm. It was Ooh. awful. It was so bad. And I was, like, in my mind, I was, like, there's got to be a better way. Um, and, you know, they make some caffeine gums that I would, like, try. But they never really, like, they never really like delivered what they promised you know it was always it was always better to like chug a red bull have a big coffee and uh yeah i ended up like i you know i saw what other influencers were able to do you know i mean kylie jenner with makeup or even like logan paul with prime and i was mm -hmm. like i was like these aren't original ideas or products right like Logan Paul made Gatorade, Kylie Jenner makeup. Like, yeah, exactly. I was like, there's a real need here for something that doesn't exist. Um, so yeah, so I ended up just emailing every manufacturer in the U S I could, I wanted to keep it in the U S cause I felt like they were going to, you know, have better control of the ingredients. They're going to be regulated by our FDA. So yeah, I emailed probably five or six manufacturers and these guys at liquid core, they had developed a technology to concentrate and put like basically concentrates into uh, pieces of gum and manufacture them at scale. And so, yeah, they were really cool. Um, they've been great to work with, but they had a bunch of formulations. They actually mailed me um, fill and empty shells of gum. And I had to like in my kitchen, like make different gum myself like put the fill in and kind of seal it and then chew it and be like okay how's this flavor does it work what could we put in there um so yeah it was like an iterative process for sure working with this manufacturer um but once once we got it right like we both were like yes this is this is it and then so from there you, you, oh, you, you just try you physically tried the flavors and then you confirmed the flavors and then let's produce that yeah so we we also have um something called alpha gpc in it um so which is like a it's a cognitive enhancer supplement um there's some there's some studies like supporting that it's 
enhances athletic performance and can enhance memory recall a little bit, um, which I thought was good. Again, energy drinks, a lot of them put, you know, dozens and dozens of different ingredients in there. I was like, let's just find two that work. Obviously, caffeine, no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. And this Alpha GPC, they were like, you know, the studies are are good. It's safe. And so I'm like, that I think would be a great other active ingredient. Um, so that was kind of what we iterated on. We iterated on like B vitamins and how much caffeine is is too much and not enough. So like some of that tweaking we did. Um, and then some of it was just getting the flavor right. We settled on a mint flavor. Um, we tried some fruit flavors, but we found that the taste was a little jarring just because, again, caffeine has kind of its own flavor and you definitely taste the caffeine again a little bit like a like a in the u.s we have five hour energies like a a Mm. caffeine concentrate so we found that the mint flavor was the one that really like smoothed everything out um but how how is the i want to know about the logistical part of the chain you know do you have a warehouse or i mean it's so so small you don't (laughs) yeah yeah so uh (laughs) my wife banned me from from keeping it in the garage or fulfilling orders myself, Damn which it. I think was the right call. I know. <laughs> um, so I use uh, Shopify. They actually have a fulfillment provider. Um, <clears throat> so I, the first pallet I actually had delivered to my house and I like did my quality checks and I had to like do some labeling. Um, and then I sent it on to Shopify's fulfillment center and then they have it in warehouses all over the country. Um, this next iteration that is actually going to be picked up from the manufacturer in Denver and then sent to uh, Shopify's like distribution network. Um, so they're handling all the fulfillment side. They also obviously are um, like the powering the website. Um, so that's that's been huge having them. And it was you know it's like a lot of work to get set up, but it is nice now that it's set. I see down to the individual pack, how much inventory I have, um, what's been fulfilled, what's out, what's been delivered, where there's still issues. Um, so again, it's, it's like a lot of things, very hard to set up, but then once it's set up, um, the process kind of runs pretty smoothly. So the, the gums that come out of the factory, they, they will send them straight to the warehouse or do you have to be a link in that? No, they'll send them straight to the warehouse. Um, I arrange for shipping, but, um, you know, they actually are in like contact with the shipping company. Usually they have like, it's a local freight company that delivers. So it's not, um, you know, and they're a, a manufacturer, like they, they know all the local freight companies, so it's not a big deal. So now you haven't had to rent any kind of warehouse or garage anymore? I rented a a storage unit for a month um, just when I had to like, because I, I wanted to see that first pallet. I, I wanted to personally inspect it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, and so I just wanted to be able to do that. Um, Shopify also requires you to like personally sign off that your products are what you say they are. So it's, I was like, okay, well, I, sh- I should probably like, put eyes on the first pallet but now you don't anymore now it's all automatic you don't need uh, to check. yeah the second i mean we just we only have the one pallet that's out now the my second pallet is actually being picked up tomorrow um and i'm still going to test that but i'm going to test it by doing just like individual orders right i'll order one tray and one pack from the second pallet and oh, um okay. so you know we'll still do checks but that first time i really wanted to know like for sure that everything was was good to go can um, I ask about numbers? And if you can't say, just like, I'm not going to answer. Yeah, but... no, we've, we've actually <clears throat> done really well. It's been launched for, I think, just a little over a week now. Um, we have done actually around $10,000 in sales so far, which is, I'm very pleased with. Uh, yeah, about that's, that's amazing, actually. Yeah, we've got around 200, between 250 and 300 orders. Um, and yeah, it took us a while to get, everything right for shipping to Canada. But then once we got Canada, we sort of figured it out. So now we can ship to the UK, we can ship to the EU. Um, so really it's, it's, uh, we're, we're delivering internationally. Uh, Shopify 
the, uh, that's a big plus on them, right? Because they they can deliver cheaply to everywhere, right? Kind of yeah. somewhat cheaply, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> Again, it's there's all it's. There's no any, there's no cheap way to get something from the U.S. to Australia for sure, um, mm-hmm. but it is it is like an affordable option, and it at least gives again Australian customers and customers in the U.K. you know a way to order it. Um, that's you know it saves us shipping an entire pallet to the U.K. and having a U.K. distribution partner, which which you know maybe one day, but for for now, I think this is the best the best way to do it. So how many, 300 orders, but then if you notice your stocks are getting low, you just order a new one from the factory, right? Or they will automatically right. fulfill it? Oh, okay. Right. So, so yeah, I monitor it in Shopify. And then when stocks are low, um, or when I'll contact the factory and, and they'll produce another pallet. Um, again, that's what we've done now already. I, I, I told them after launch, I'm like, Oh yeah, maybe in a month we'll like need another pallet. And now we're like, you know, I contacted them a week after launch and I'm like, Hey guys, just <laughs> might need you to run, run production here. So, you know, they were glad they, they, they're, you know, they're here to make money too. They're happy to fulfill, fulfill, uh, you know, more, more gum orders. I, I love hearing, but I'm just doing a similar thing right now. Uh, a product that I cannot name. At the moment, I don't want to publish it at all, but it's it's same. It's logistics. It's about getting. I'm using uh, a logistic fulfillment service like you are, and uh, about getting. Mine is being produced in Ukraine, right? Because I go to Ukraine oh. regularly, almost every month, and I'm going in one week also go just to see the factory of of it and getting that. It's outside of European Union, so getting that to um, to the fulfillment center in the EU is such a headache. Uh, and oh, Ukrainian man. customs are like cor- they're not corrupt, but they're like it's sometimes in, when they screw with you, you got a bribe, you know. It's 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 weird, but it's such like you said, you learn so much. I'm also I'm only three months into the process. I'm like mind blown every day, and it's such a struggle after struggle. Problems hit you left and right. You fix one, another one comes, and it's never like a plateau. It's always like that. And I feel I feel kind of des- desperate right now. It's where I am at, so yeah. it's it's nice to hear about your story. Actually, it worked out. <clears throat> yeah, and and to be clear, I've given you the nice like retrospective. That is the exact experience I had, where I was yeah, just really? like, okay. I I got to a point with one issue, and I'm not gonna like, I don't want to out anybody, but like I had to uh, find the email of the COO of a publicly traded company and contact them and be like. Guys, I have a problem and no one seems to be able to solve it. Like, I need you to help me. And I, to my great shame, I try so hard not to do this in my life, but I had to be like, I'm an influencer. I have an audience. Please <laughs> oh, help me. Card, I'm man. desperate. I'm just, I, I, I felt dirty afterward. I had to shower. And I was like, oh, <laughs> never again. But I just, I, I was desperate. I was desperate. <laughs> And you know what? It worked. It worked. Really? I wish it didn't. It yeah, yeah, it worked. And I was cool. I it was an email. That's better than me like posting about it, making a video, you know. But you, you pushed all through all of the small issues. You got it working in the end. Yeah, I mean, it, it's never. There's never an end, right? You know, like you. There's 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 some business influence I really like. Who's just like, if you're succeeding, you just your prize is just the next problem, you know? Like, if you truly don't want to have any problems with a business, then, like, shut down your business, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's it's true. It's like, I'm so happy sales have been as good as they are, and so I'm like, oh, well, I should be advertising. Let's try to advertise on some different platforms. And, like, every one of them is extremely frustrating to deal with. There is there, I have yet to find an easy, straightforward advertising platform. But, you know, it's it's good it's like if you have a successful brand that people like you should let them know about it and so i'm gonna just you know when we're when we're done here i'm gonna log into google ads and try to figure out what's going on there you know and you're doing all of that by yourself there's no company that runs ads for you or seu seo or something like that no i mean my website designer she like optimized it for seo but um no we're we're running this all ourselves again it's to me it's like it's a challenge i like learning it and i 
I'm more confident in like my own ability. And truly, if, if I get to a point where I'm like, I really can't figure this out. Yeah. I would, I would bring in some outside help, but. So, um, we, we cannot talk about everything. Like I, I don't want to publish stuff also, but there's like very specific issues that I I'm dealing with. And I would love to maybe we just like discuss them after the podcast is over. Cause yeah. the publishing time is not here yet. If you're struggling with logistics, you cannot publish the, like, the thing because yeah. you don't know if it, yeah, no, how it's going to move you know? yeah. but uh, I guess I would actually how do you say and like catch this tie loose ends or I don't know well it, it has been such a blast talking to you again and doing this podcast and uh, I hope we can do it again in the future actually yeah likewise no I'm, <clears throat> I'm definitely down for it this is this is the my favorite podcast to be on yeah, yeah, woo. yeah. <laughs> Not that I've had that many podcasts, but you know. Strike gum in the description below. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Check the description below for strike gum, definitely. And also your channel, Combat Veteran Reacts. Yep. You, you haven't thought about like just putting your name on it, just. Nah, at this point, I'm like, I don't, I don't want to mess with the brand, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a brand now, yeah. Of course, when you get to a three hundred thousand, like subscribers it's big enough so you cannot actually make small changes so fast anymore right yeah yeah exactly you're just gonna confuse people they won't they'll be like whose channel is this it's the same mm -hmm. one still the same guy all right but thank you so much my friends for watching if you're if you're still here way to go <laughs> and uh, i'll see you in the next podcast yep cheers cheers